who are listening. So if you're not able to get to church and you are able to get to the website, you can at least listen to a sermon. Now, there's much more to a service than a sermon. Let's get that out of the way. Hopefully, you will gain something today from the entire service, and hopefully, I pray, uh, also, the message that I'm going to deliver. I will tell you that I had some concern about this sermon, because uh, I like to use objects, and I've got a bunch of them today. Matter of fact, there are five. And if you don't remember anything else about the objects themselves, you will see that they all deal with the word, word. St. Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I am prone at times to ramble in my thinking and my speaking, as some of you may know. And I am prone to speak fast, as some of you know. Pastor Muller and I are trying to affect each other. I want him to speak a little quicker. Not necessarily. And he wants me to speak a little slower. So we'll see how well that goes today. I'd like to begin this sermon a little bit different method than perhaps I've done before. I want to educate you about the different generations. Because you're involved in one of these generations. The GI generation is those people born from 1900 to 1924. If you were born between 1900 and 1924, raise your hand. Yeah, I thought so, Eugene. I thought you would do that. And some of you may not remember when you were born, and that's okay. (laughs) The next generation is the silent majority, born in 1925 through 1945. If you're part of the silent majority, raise your hand. Believe it or not. I'm a part of the silent majority. (laughs) Yeah, most of you won't believe that, would you? I really wanted to be a baby boomer, but I missed it by half a year. My mom and dad decided to have me born early. I was premature. I am a baby boomer. I think I am. Well, we'll go on. Baby boomers, 1946, 1964. Raise your hand. Okay, we're getting more of you. Gen X. 1965 to 1979. Raise your hands. Yeah, Jeff, you better get yours up. Okay, very good. The Y generation, 1980 to the late 90s. Oh, we've got one. Alex, way to go. Sarah, come on. Let's get that up there a little higher. All right. And then the, I like this one, the Z generation or the I generation. Do you know why it's called the I generation? iPhones and iPads, which I have here today. Also called the Z, and that's from 2000, late 90s to 2010. That's all they have so far. But I would like to add one more that I am sure will take place, and I'm not thrilled about it. I'm going to call it the genderless generation. As we see what's happening in the world around us, there will come a time when it will all be identified as genderless. Somewhere out east, they've now developed 67 different gender identifications. Can you imagine that? That's the direction the culture is headed. Now, in the midst of all this, comes God's word. And it is suitable for every generation. I'm getting older, and you all recognize that, but I will say this. From my perspective, there needs to be a difference in the church culture from the rest of the culture. That when you come to worship, there is a difference. Because we're celebrating what God does amongst us, and we cannot do that without his word. Or without receiving forgiveness of sins through confession and absolution. Without that, we are nothing. Regardless of the style of the songs, there are at least six different things that we do in worship that are significant and are different from the culture around us. So bear with me as we get into the Word as it deals with the Word. First object I'd like to share with you is the iPad. And I brought it today because I can't really open it up. Well, I could if I wanted to. I could have somebody help me, I'm sure. And I have a lot of different apps. And one of the apps I have on my iPhone is Words with Friends. And I use it fairly often. Now, you can be a 
good person when you work with words for friends, or you can be a little bit testy. For example, you can take a seven-letter word, and you can take the letters on your little screen, and you can go out to another website and find out what words you can make with it, which I call cheating. Because you might get more points that way. I do not do that. I did it once, and that was enough. But I think some of the other people I play with do use that method. I also want you to know that on this iPad, I have the NIV Bible. I have the Bible on my iPad, and I like to use the hard copy, but it does come in valuable for research. So one of the things I want to share with you is that in the ESV Bible, not my favorite translation, but for many of you it is, did you know there are 757,439 words? That's a lot of words, isn't it? And if you did a little more research, you'd find out in the Gospel of John, John uses the word 45 times. For those of us who understand the Bible and the importance of it, we begin with John chapter 1. The word became flesh, Jesus Christ, and dwelt among us. Do you know what that means? God came in the flesh in Jesus Christ. That is a supernatural, to some people, unbelievable event. And so we teach about the incarnation, the birth of Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit. We talk about him living a perfect life and dying a perfect life for our imperfection. You can go all through the Gospel of John and you'll find the word as it deals with Jesus Christ. Today I pray that we might find in ourselves, through the work of the Holy Spirit, that all of the scriptures and all of what we do today leads us to the words that lead to eternal life. Now, there are some words in our culture that are opposed to God, and they are completely different than what God would have for us. Here are the first words, and these words all begin with another word, don't. The first word I want to talk about is don't suffer. The world says don't suffer. Some of the people at the time of Jesus Christ wondered if he would not create stuff like manna so they would not have to work anymore. He fed 5,000 people with fish and bread. And wouldn't it be great if he just did that all the time? No more work. Just let him take care of you. Don't suffer. It says in John chapter 6, our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. Well, what does that look like today? Don't suffer for us today. Have you heard someone say, if God really loved me, this would not have happened to me? If God really cares? If God is God, why are these things happening to me? I think this is a true statement. I, if I'm wrong, let me know. No one will get out of this world without some kind of suffering. It's part of the human condition. It goes back to what we know from the Old Testament, Adam and Eve. Don't be surprised if you suffer. Here are another two words. Don't wait. The world doesn't want to wait for anything. Yesterday I was driving somewhere and I stopped at a stop sign or a stop and there was a stoplight. And somebody, I could tell behind me, had to get around me. I wasn't driving fast enough. And you know what happened to them after they passed me on the right? They got stopped. They made one car in advance. Don't wait. John chapter 6. From this time, after Jesus spoke about what was going to take place, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. It happens today, too. Every generation I've spoken about, some have left the church. I remember visiting a man in Iowa when I was a pastor there. He was an older gentleman, and he and his wife had not been in church for quite a long time. And I asked him what he thought would happen to him after he died. He said, oh, not much. No, he was raised in the church, but he had left. And he had left the faith that God had led him to believe about life after death. There are times when people were close to Christians, but then they abandoned their relationship with fellow believers. Either out of guilt or too busy with life. There are times when people have been close to the Bible, but removed themselves from the Bible because it wasn't comfortable. Things in the Bible don't make us comfortable. That's not the purpose. It's to bring us to the conclusion that we need forgiveness of sins. 
Sometimes people have left being close to a caring community. We're going to be looking at a vision statement here. And what I've heard from people is we care for one another. But you know there are others outside the church that need to be cared for too. Not just the people that are here. Some time ago I was watching Good Morning America. And here's what they said. We have lost the sense of community altogether. I found this out last week. Last Friday I went to attend my 55th high school reunion. 55 years. And I drove back to the little town where I went to high school and the little town where I grew up and close to the farm where I was raised. And nothing is the same. It gets to be a little bit depressing when your life is not the same. We used to live alongside a railroad track that went from Cincinnati to St. Louis. It was the highest point between St. Louis and Cincinnati on the New York Central Railroad. It's gone. All that's there is a field. And the community that once was a community is no longer a community. People don't know each other. People don't have the same level of care as they had. That's the culture we live in. Do you know your neighbors? How well do you know your neighbors? Do you care about your neighbors? That's part of what it means to be God's people here. So home, as I found out being there last week, is not Illinois. You've heard the saying, home is where the heart is. Let's take it another step. Home is where his heart is. And home is where his people are. Do you miss someone else when they're not here? I hope you do. This is part of your family. Whether you're a guest or not, today you're a part of our family. And we thank God for you. And we pray for our church family at large. The next two words, don't, by the way, we'll get to the gospel. Just hang in there, okay? The next two words, don't believe. In John chapter 6, before our text, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? In other words, who is this guy? Five years ago, I went to my high school reunion. One of the girls in my class couldn't believe I was a pastor. I don't know why. (laughs) It may have had something to do with high school. (laughs) No prophet is accepted in his hometown. Jesus made that comment. Don't believe. Today it's couched in these words. Who says Christianity is the only way to heaven? You take your way, I'll take my way. Many of us were taught about Luther's brass ring of doctrines. You know what they are? This is a list of beliefs that we have that if one is taken away, we lose. We lose. Listen to these list of things. Which one would you want to lose? Creation? If we don't believe in God being the creator of all things, we're in trouble, folks. Or what about this marriage? Or this one, forgiveness. Or this one, true presence. Or this one, grace alone. This one, faith alone, word alone. We don't ever want to lose those. Now, when I was doing research on the word, this is a little sidetrack. We'll come back. Don't worry. Look at your watch. It's okay. We'll get there. Do you know that Luther was involved in one of the first viral communications of the social media of the 16th century? True. True. What he put on the door of Wittenberg went viral. The 95 Theses. It wasn't posted on Facebook. It was posted on a castle door. And then it went everywhere. Not because of the internet, but because of the Gutenberg press. And people saw this and read it, and it got sent everywhere. Now, do you think that was by coincidence? Or was it God at work communicating the forgiveness of sins that brings eternal life? And it's been going on ever since. The next two words. Don't distinguish. Don't distinguish little g in God from big G. You got your God, I got mine. I'm reading through the Old Testament again and how many times did Israel go after other gods? I won't list all the gods people have today, but you can think of them. One of them might be money. 
Uh, one might be fame. One might be pride. One might be God who's not personal or my God. Here's another God for you today, the lesser of two evils. I choose what I do, but I'm choosing the lesser of two evils. Oh, it's evil, but it's not as bad as the other evil. Or the greater good. Some time ago, we were using products of abortion to do good things. And that makes it okay. Really? To take a life? To make a life? The only time that was okay for us was when Christ died for us. And it really wasn't okay for him in the sense of what he went through for us. Here's one more for you to think about in the world today. I just read about this the other day. Do you know in Sweden they have mobile assisted suicide units? They're actually in vans and they drive around. And, and if you've been diagnosed with cancer, you can just say, okay, I'm done. Get me out of here. That's what the world's come to. But thank God, when Peter said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He knew that Jesus Christ meant it. So listen to these words. First and foremost, God loves. This is the ESV Bible. And uh, I chose it today not because it's my favorite, but I know that it has 437,399 words or something like that. It's accurate. But what's in here? What's between the first page and the last page? Is it not filled with God's love for us? And you all know this verse. I'm not going to ask you to say it with me. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. There's the word believe. And believe it or not, it's mentioned 40 some times in the book of John. Believe. Believe that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. Not only that, God loves us to death. What did Jesus say after he took the drink on the cross? He said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. One of the challenges I think we have in the church today, personally and with other congregations as well, is we leave him in the grave. We make sure we all know that he died for us. But do you believe that he rose again, that he ascended into heaven, and that he sends his spirit to be with us? There is no way I could do this today without his spirit at work. I couldn't do it. Aren't you thankful that the spirit is at work? And that same spirit is at work in you to accomplish what he wants to accomplish through you because he's still alive. And one day he's going to return. And everything we've ever been concerned about will be taken care of, gone away. Christ also loves us today. Listen again to the text. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Listen to what a chaplain says about troops in Afghanistan or Iraq. After sending to them out and giving them communion, communion reminded these warriors that Christ himself knew something about battle and sacrifice. What a great connection. He goes on to write, Communion was a way to partake of something spiritually concrete before rushing into a field of battle full of intangibles and uncertainties. Are there intangibles today in your life? Things we don't have control over? Perhaps what other people say? What others do? It's intangible. And yet Christ offers us his presence. How about uncertainties today? The political world around us, are you getting tired of the ads? They're all bad. Wouldn't it be great to have one candidate speak positively about the other? Whoa! Not going to happen. What about the calamities of life? Uncertainties. What could happen on a pleasant day going out on a duck boat never to return again or a bridge in another country that collapses or someone in North St. Louis not being alive today because of some crime yesterday you name it calamities come and yet Christ promises to be with those who believe in him to go through those calamities with them the next two words is love God. 
Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Wow. Just think about it for a minute. Who spoke those words? You know about him. Some people call him impetuous Peter. He put his foot in his mouth every time. Or he was outspoken Peter. He was also a forgiven Peter. And he was a future ambassador Peter. Why? Because Christ prayed for him. Christ died for him. Christ went with him. And it's no different for you and I. Christ prayed for us. Christ comes to us. And Christ goes with us. The last two words. Love people. I love this. It's a, I think it's the completion of John 3.16. It's 1 John. That's the epistle. 3.16. Listen to these words. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. This is where the blank piece of paper and the pencil comes in. If you had an iPhone like I do or one of those fancy phones, you can start the timer now. And the timer represents the rest of your life. It's a blank slate, isn't it? Now, what are you going to do with it? I suggest that you consider words that completes what your life is all about. Now that you know that Christ loves you, forgives you, and will go with you. Oh, and by the way, uh, this is not like a golf pencil. You notice the golf pencils don't have erasers? There's a reason. <laughs> yeah, because I play golf. That's the reason why they don't have erasers. This pencil has an eraser. Luther said we were to go out and sin boldly. Not go out and do it consciously on purpose, but know that we are going to sin. And so we get an eraser. Every confession and absolution is an eraser. And God helps us. He encourages us and says, okay, get up, Jim. It's time to go again. But now, today, at this time, on Sunday morning, this is a blank slate. So in response to the word that became flesh, in response to the word that is eternal, may God lead us and take those steps, small steps, tiny steps, as our worship spills over into our life. May God go with us. Amen? Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding Guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus in the life everlasting.